today are two major players on Batwoman. We have Rachel Scarson, who plays Kate Kane's rival, Alice, and Caroline Dries, the show's executive producer. Thank you so much for being here, you two. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Let's talk about Batwoman. Um, season one was such a fun ride. What do you think makes this show so unique within the bigger Arrowverse? When I originally read the Batwoman comics, the thing that stuck out the most to me was this family drama. And I think what makes our show unique is that we, our family drama is about the protagonist and it's also about the antagonist. And that's really what is special about that woman. It's this sister-sister dynamic. She is the sibling, uh, the, and not just the sibling, the twin sister of our hero. So in every way, she's equally matched. You know, this real uh, dilemma for both of them because they can't ever really kill one another. I mean, you you might feel like you want to kill your family all the time, but you don't kill your family. I mean, hopefully you don't kill anybody. But uh, for them, they, they can never really cross that, that line uh, because they're, they're twins. Alice gave Hush Bruce Wayne's face. What is her master plan? Tommy in one version of the comic books does become Bruce Wayne in, in a messed up, um, you know, permutation of Bruce. So we embraced that and it wasn't until Alice needed him to be Bruce Wayne that it occurred to her, oh, this will be perfect. So um, once Alice realized that that little shard of kryptonite she needed to kill her sister was somewhere in the bowels of Wayne Enterprises, which could be literally anywhere, the idea of making a man who could waltz through the front door and say, where's my kryptonite was like the you know, the perfect answer to her, her problem. We will hopefully get to see the fallout of that when we launch into season two. Season two is going to be start with a bang. It's going to really start like, holy cow, I cannot believe they're doing this. We saw Beth go from innocent, naive child Beth into a woman who can stand up for herself. And then there's a sort of gap in her past where you know, we, when we meet her in the pilot, she has like her little army of henchmen and she's just this cold blooded killer. And I think there's this, this gap in that past that we, that we get to need to explore. Like how did she become the leader of the Wonderland gang? And we teed up season one, this villain named Sophia, who if you're familiar with the Batwoman comics, has a storyline on this island of Coriana. And we decided to make sort of our um, villain spine of season two centered around Sophia, who we've teed up is somebody that Alice is terrified of. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be really great to see Alice clash with this woman who can actually psychologically manipulate Alice and sort of becomes her, her, a true enemy to her. Welcome back to the show, Gail Simone. Oh, hello, Amy. It's so good to see you again. How are you doing right now? I've been playing Animal Crossing along with most of the rest of the world Guilty. during this <laughs> lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> so that's been a, a nice distraction. And sometimes when I see people that I know and that I, especially that I miss, that are we meet on the island in Animal Crossing, I'm like, oh, I miss you so much. It feels like you're getting to visit a little bit. What DC comics are you reading right now? It's very cool to have. Um, DC Universe because there's so much available and since I started writing Flash especially I've been really digesting from Silver Age comics and loving like the wonder of it all. When it comes to comics I really feel like the biggest sin that you can commit in, in comics creation is to be boring. We are going to start with Wonder Woman. You did one of my all-time favorite runs on Wonder Woman. What was your vision for her? Her origin story is a birth story. And I started looking at how many of the previous writers had actually given birth, and there really wasn't too many. And I noticed that her creation was very idealized and didn't represent what I and many of my friends and family have gone through while giving birth. So I wanted to add some, I didn't want it idealized, I wanted to add some fear and blood and things being a little bit uncomfortable. Wonder Woman means a lot to me personally, for one thing. Um, I had grown really frustrated with the stories with uh, female 
heroes growing up. And when I came upon Wonder Woman in a comic, it really changed the game for me and how I looked at what I thought a lead female heroine should be and what she should represent. And so many times, not only do we, you know, in the past have resorted to stereotypes of women or idealized versions that are not being told from the point of view of a woman. And I really felt that if I was going to be given the chance to write this amazing character that I didn't want to shy away from the feminine themes of her character that I felt should have been there. You are currently writing new stories for The Flash, and they have been so much fun, especially King Shark, who I'm always down for at all times. <laughs> what kind of new challenges did you want to bring to the character? When they told me that they were going to be designed for the new Flash reader to attract people who haven't read Flash before, as well as just being great Flash stories for anyone to enjoy, I got really excited because that meant I could borrow from all different eras of Flash and take what I felt were the best things so and make this one amazing Flash. And dealing with the Barry and Iris relationship and the Flash robes is just so much fun. And once I realized that he's a crime scene investigator and that I could write little mysteries among, you know, all the superhero stuff, then I started getting really excited about it. And now it's you know, one of my favorite things to write is The Flash. The rest of you out there, if you have not yet read Gale's runs on Wonder Woman, on Birds of Prey, and so much more, get on it. They are all right here on DC Universe. I'm joined by some cast members from the new movie Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. We've got Jason O'Mara, aka Batman, Chris Gorham, aka The Flash, and executive producer James Tucker, a.k.a. James Tucker. Guys, thank you so much for being here. This is awesome. Such a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this is great. You know, this has been such a long journey with these characters for you guys. What were the three of you feeling going into Apocalypse War? Yeah. We kind of got the, the notice that we needed to, um, to, to finish off this continuity, and it was just, let's just get it done. And so, um, you know, I haven't processed it yet, so I'll be a mess. <laughs> Uh, what are the three of you most excited for fans to see in this installment? Darkseid is so utterly powerful in this. To see all of the heroes kind of rally around. It also draws from Justice League, Justice League Dark, Suicide Squad, Teen Titans. You know, it really is epic. This is this is as big a story as we've told so far. So in that way, I think it's a really fitting finale. James, what are you most excited for fans to see in this movie? Well, you know, apart from the the bigness of it, I think it's there's a lot of quality humor in it. It's just there's parts that are really funny. There's like a Constantine Captain Boomerang exchange that I that kind of was semi ad libbed, and we just kind of built on it. Um, and then there's uh, of course the Constantine King Shark moment that everyone <laughs> seems to be running away with. Um, so little stuff like that. It's fairly easy to do the 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 hard hitting kind of violent stuff. Mm -hmm. It's fun. But it's to get generate an emotion like laugh, you know, uh, humor, uh, making someone happy along with the shocks and thrills is, is it's addictive. Chris, what about you? What are you most excited for fans to see in this movie? In, in this movie, uh, we get to see different sides of the Flash that we haven't seen much of in this series. Uh, we get to see him deal with some some pretty heavy physical and emotional um, trauma. And I think it's uh, it's really compelling. It's nice to see that development with him. And so I think. Um, the ending is really earned. What do these heroes mean to you? I mean, particularly in this movie, they I think they mean hope. Even though they royally screwed up at the beginning, um, <laughs> they they make it, you know, they try to make it good, you know, and they, they, they do so because they haven't really given up hope. They keep trying. Um, they're, each of them has someone they love that is motivating them through the story. And I, I think that allows us to do all the other, you know, damage and carnage but at the <laughs> core of it, it is about love and hope and redemption the fact that there is this sort of 15 or 16 movie sort of canon that people can watch sequentially like a series of binge watch it and and every episode if you watch it in order fits and and, and that's never going to go away that's going to be there forever and as far yeah. as i'm concerned once batman always batman so um i'm always going to be here <laughs> you will be mugged at conventions from, from now on. This movie in particular is particularly well positioned for the time that we're in. Um, and, uh, and I think it leaves on a really um, nice uh, note uh, uh, with hope if 
some in uncertainty, but I think that's a really grown up place to leave it. And I think, you know, these um, films have kind of grown up as we've, um, as we've made them. So um, just yeah. grateful. Well, you guys can watch Justice League Dark Apocalypse War now on digital and on 4K Ultra HD and Blu-ray on May 19th. <laughs>